Good morning and welcome to everyone that's joined this webinar on occupational stress, which is the second in the series on this particular topic. Uh, this webinar will be focused on proactive and preventative measures to be taken to help minimise cases of occupational stress. We'll also be looking at the strategies to help keep these cases out of the tribunals and the courts. Uh, my name is Jack Verdi and I'm a solicitor at Mills and Reeve and I work within the Birmingham Casualty Team. I'm joined by my colleague Angela Lown who's an employment solicitor who works in the employment team in Birmingham. And last but not least, uh, I'm also joined by my colleague, Chris Goff, who heads up the casualty team in Birmingham. And just a few housekeeping rules before we officially kickstart proceedings. Uh, this session is being recorded. Whilst you can see us, we can't see you. Uh, we won't have time for questions at the end. However, should any questions arise, we wish to put to any of us uh, during the course of the webinar, you may do so by using the question and answers uh, box uh, below. Uh, so please do feel free to send us any questions and we'll use that as an opportunity after the event to follow up with you. Alternatively, if there's anything further you'd like to hear us uh, discuss and or present on, please let us know, give us your feedback towards at the end of the webinar and we can take that on board. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to jump straight into slides on this particular webinar. Firstly, we're going to, I'll split this uh, webinar into three main categories, areas of focus. We're going to be looking at proactivity and prevention, and I will be discussing that, uh, looking at ways and means of managing and minimizing cases of occupational stress. Uh, Angela will be considering the challenges and tactics within the employment tribunal, and her perspective will be slightly more technical. And last but not least, we have Chris, who's going to be talking about the challenges and tactics for compensation claims in the civil courts. And he will be looking at it through the eyes of a litigator. And I'm just gonna go into my Chris Whitty uh, uh, channel, my inner Chris Whitty. So if I could have the next slide, please. Proactivity and prevention, three ma main areas of focus, which I would like to talk about. First being the Stevenson Pharma Review, and then we'll look at risk assessing. What do we mean by risk assessments? How do we go about risk assessing occupational stress, and we'll also touch upon reasonable adjustments at the end. Next slide, please. So the Stevenson Farmer Review. For those who may not be familiar with the Stevenson Farmer Review, I would like to just give a brief background. Uh, back in January 2017, then Prime Minister Theresa May uh, wanted to uh, commission an independent review with regards to how employers could better support the mental health of those within employment. At around that time, there was a steady increase of work-related illness. So the government wanted to look a bit more closely as to what was going on within the economy in various sectors, what sort of steps were employers doing to safeguard the welfare of their employees and what further steps could be undertaken. Uh, at the bottom of the slide, which you'll see on the screen, of, there's a link there which takes you directly to the Stevenson Farmer Review, which is a report. It's over 80 pages long and quite in depth, uh, really insightful information within. I do encourage and highly recommend everyone uh, takes time to re review and read the report and take on board what's been recommended. Uh, we don't have time today to go through that report, but I just wanted to focus on the six key recommendations, which in my view will help minimize and perhaps and manage cases of occupational stress. The first being <clears throat> produce, implement a mental health at work plan. The second being developing mental health, work, uh, mental health awareness among employees. Third, encouraging open conversations about mental health and the support available when employees are struggling. Fourth, provide employees with good working conditions. And number five, promote effective people management. And number six, routinely monitoring employee and mental well-being. And I just want to emphasize one final point on the Stevenson Farm Review. The purpose and intention of the report was not to help employers minimize claims, uh, but it was obviously to improve and look at ways of uh, supporting employees with their well-being within the workplace. However, I firmly believe that should employers take on board the, heart, the recommendations within the report, it's going to have the desired effect of minimizing cases and eventual potential claims that arrive in the tribunal and the courts. Next slide, please. So risk assessing work-related stress. Uh, 
I want to look at first the, the duties upon employers. Uh, it's, it's worthwhile reminding what, the, what is the legal duty with regards to risk, risk assessments and more specifically stress risk assessments. So all employers have a legal duty to assess risks to employees' health and safety, which they're exposed to as a result of their work. Now, this is a common law duty as well as a statutory duty under the Management and Health and Safety Regulations 99. So it's a non-delegable duty, uh, which, which in a essence means the courts expect employers to assess risks to health and, so health and safety posed by the place of work and the system of work. And this does include stress, occupational stress and mental well-being. From my time in practice, I would say over the past five years, there's a steady increase in the number of stress risk assessments, which I am seeing uh, as part of my review and papers. Prior to that, stress risk assessments were few and far between. However, I do believe that since the implementation or the review of Steams and Pharma, we are now gradually seeing employers look at stress a bit more closely and assessing that risk, as opposed to your common types of risk assessments, which we, which we may have already seen trips, slips, working at height, manual handling. So occupational stress is on a steady incline as opposed to being risk assessed, but, but not that prevalent. And I believe there are areas of improvement and going forwards as we come out of this pandemic, coming out with awareness around mental well-being, the courts will be looking more closely as to what employers are doing with regards to manage, managing and minimizing risks associated with occupational stress and expect employers to be carrying out such risk assessments. Next slide, please. Just to underline the points, I've inserted a really, very useful case on Kennedy and Cordier's Supreme Court judgment, which again just emphasizes the importance of risk assessment and kind of gives an, an indication as to how the judiciary are going to be looking at risk assessments in the forthcoming uh, years. And we'll hear, hear a bit more about from Chris as to how, they be, how he believes they're likely to be looking at these sorts of claims. Next slide, please. So what needs to be considered within a risk assessment? I've broken this down into five main areas. Firstly, obvious risks. Now, what's obvious to the employer will depend on the, upon the, on the sector. But I'll take a, an example from a retail client. Christmas time is really busy in shops. There's higher footfall. Everyone's out buying presents. So naturally, there's going to be increased uh, pressure upon employees to serve those customers. So, that, so that's going to be an obvious risk during that part, time of the year and that pinch point within, the, within that calendar year. So again, it's going to be very sector dependent. Known risks. Known risks may not necessarily be obvious risks, but known will be as the employer is on notice, perhaps based on previous sickness records, some sickness absences or previous claims, and perhaps even exit interviews where employees can be a bit more candid as to how they felt uh, during their time with the employer. Foreseeable, foreseeable will be based on what's obvious and known or what the employee should have known not so obvious as well and this is an interesting concept uh, which was considered in this case of Chisholm which I've uh, inserted a reference point there where the judge in that case believed that employers are under duty to seek out knowledge of risks which are not themselves obvious. Causes a bit of a grey area as it you ask yourself well, how far does an employer have to go but I believe the whole intention of this judgment the, the reason behind the same is not for employees not to treat risk assessments as simply a tick box exercise. They need to keep up with the changing developments within the relevant sector and seek out knowledge and guidance. And such knowledge and guidance, as again in Chisholm, can be discovered by consulting readily available guidance. So what sort of guidance are we talking about? Guidance could be from health and safety consultants that are, are widely available. It could be from the health and safety executive as well. It could be occupational support, uh, which some companies and organisations are already utilising, but also your legal, legal advisors will be able to help you with regards to keeping up with risks and the developments in relative sectors. Next slide, please. On the point of guidance, uh, again, I've inserted a, a really useful link to the Health and Safety Executives Management Standards Guide, 
uh, and it gives you information as to how the HSC would recommend approaching risk assessing occupational stress. Again, it's quite a detailed document uh, and it will go into a bit more, far more detail than I intend to, to do today. But the HSC focuses it on six key areas which ideally need to be considered by employers when risk assessing occupational stress. Are those being demands? So what are the demands upon the employees that work within the organisation? That should be closely monitored. Control. How much controls do employees have or do not have? Because there is a correlation perhaps between a lack of control and increased pressure, perhaps stress in more serious cases. Support. What's the organization's uh, approach to support? Do they have buddy systems? Is there, is there clear lines of management and support available? Relationships. What is the organization's uh, approach to relationships? Do people work in a collaborative manner or do they work individually in silos? The role. Are the roles defined by the employer within the organization? Do the employees know what their, what their job requirements are? Uncertainty around that can also lead to increased stress. And finally, change. Change can be unsettling for some people. So it's important for employees to recognise that any change within the organisation should be handled pr uh, properly, efficiently, and also communicated appropriately to employees to put their mind at ease. And out of all those six key recommendations, I, was, I would certainly say to employers that they should be focusing upon demands, support and relationships, as these three common themes keep cropping up in the cases that I've advised on uh, when dealing with claims associated with occupational stress. Next slide, please. Reasonable adjustments. I don't intend to speak too, in too much detail about reasonable adjustments. Uh, again, I just want to highlight an article that I've pre previously written on the topic, which goes into quite, quite a lot of detail as to what reasonable adjustments are and when they should be considered. But the point I wanted to make today in terms of managing risks, uh, employers, of course, are aware that there is a duty to consider and permit reasonable adjustments once there are notice that an employee has an impairment, whether it's, it's, uh, it's psychological or it's physical, there's a duty there to consider and implement risk uh, reasonable adjustments. Some employers, however, are caught out by not appreciating there's a proactive duty as well. There's, so there is a proactive duty for an employer to consider a reasonable adjustment if it's foreseeable that harm may arise to an employee should the employer not allow the same. Now, I'll give an example of an employee who perhaps may struggle to get to work by 9 a.m. every morning due to perhaps childcare issues or late traffic, and that employee has a pre-existing vulnerability or pre-existing history regarding anxiety. And as part of that employee's uh, request for reasonable adjustment, they ask for perhaps starting late and finishing late to alleviate that stress in the morning, uh, which would help keep the anxiety under control. Now, in those set of circumstances, if it's foreseeable that an employer does not allow the reasonable adjustment, the employee may go on to suffer an episode of anxiety and perhaps more serious cases, long-term sickness. So an employer would be under a duty in that case to consider the reasonable adjustment and if it's not going to allow the reason adjustment, there needs to be good reasons for it. Next slide, please. Just to sum up everything I've discussed this morning, uh, I've, 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 I've created seven key recommendations, which I believe employers should be taking on board. The first being seek investment from the uh, support from the top of the organization in order for the whole culture and approach to mental well-being changing within the workplace to help employees with the well-being, there needs to be recognition from senior level within the organisations that change is required. So you need to get support and investment from the top. And that should, in my opinion, lead on to a stress and mental well-being policy. I'm seeing more and more employers implementing such policies in workplaces and, and having a document on their system, which is available to employees, which shows they recognise this as an issue within the workplace. I would recommend that being implemented as well. Internal consultation, mentioned by uh, previous case, uh, previous slides regarding seeking out knowledge and information. In internal consultations, a good way in finding the stresses within your business 
perhaps it's by way of a confidential uh, employee survey or part of your annual reviews with your employees or perhaps ju just as a fact finding mission that's also highly recommended external consultations again going back to the point of seeking out knowledge of risks and challenges at the hsc there's a wealth of information on their website then you you have occupational help uh, sorry occupational health as well that you can seek support from and guidance and also the, the society of occupational medicine once again, there's a wealth of information on their website, and within that organization, there are many experts that can also guide and assist. And last but not least, your legal advisors. Uh, I've made the point earlier that the whole of the approach to creating risk assessments and a policy is not to be taken as a tick box exercise. So on that note, it would be worthwhile seeking input from your legal advisors as to whether this particular policy all these risk assessments, would they stand up under scrutiny should this matter go to a tribunal or court? So again, there's, there's external consultation there as well. Now, preparing the risk assessments, having carried out cons consultations, gathered all the information, now it's time to prepare the risk assessments. What sort of approach are you going to take? Are you going to have a generic risk assessment that applies to the entire organisation? Or do you wish perhaps a stepped approach, a bit more tailored bespoke approach depending on the part the the function within a particular part of the business uh, for example an employer that employs thousands of employees uh, across the country or the globe is one generic occupational risk assessment going to be sufficient or adequate i would perhaps argue not in that case do you want to consider a stepped more tailored approach uh, to, uh, guided by the type of work which a particular part of the business conducts. For example, uh, you have an accountant's firm, a large accountant's firm, you have a team of accountants, you'll have IT support, you'll have finance. Are the same stressors going to apply to the accountants that would be to the people in IT or finance? Perhaps not. So you may want to consider a bit more individual approach. And finally, I want to mention as well individual risk assessments. During the whole consultation process, or perhaps uh, down to pr uh, prior notice, you may rec identify an individual who has a pre-existing vulnerability, and you will you may want to seriously consider risk, assess risk assessing any individual cases. On that note, I would highly recommend seeking occupational health uh, for uh, conducting such risk assessments, and of course, considering reasonable adjustments then you want to be keeping all of these uh, risk assessments, these policies under regular review and action accordingly. I would recommend a risk assessment being updated at least once a year, but again, it's entirely dependent on the organization and perhaps uh, external events uh, in society. For example, this pandemic, it's been a quite stressful time, uncertain time. And in such uh, extended, ex exceptional circumstances, you may want to increase that to twice a year. Again, ent entirely depends. And finally, documenting and preserving. When I say document and preserve, I don't strictly mean the policy and the risk assessments. It's also what worthwhile documenting uh, and keeping a paper trail of the information that's collated with regards to your external and internal consultations. I'm just thinking, thinking of this as a worst case scenario basis, should a particular case arrive at the tribunal at the court it's going to be really powerful evidence for an employer to show, look, we have a stress policy, we have, a, we have risk assessments as well, but these aren't a tick box exercise, and here's the evidence to prove that, here's all the consultation evidence. So again, that's something I would certainly uh, recommend to employers. So that brings to the end of my part of this webinar. I hope everyone has found this informative and useful. I'm now going to pass over to my colleague, Angela Lowne, who will speak about the Employment Tribunal. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Um, first, I need to apologise for the drilling that's just started outside. Hopefully it won't last too long and hopefully you'll still be able to hear me. Um, so I'm going to talk today about some of the more technical elements of stress at work claims in the employment tribunal. So what sort of claims can you expect? Well, the first is constructive unfair dismissal. And typically, an employee will argue that the employer's conduct in subjecting them to occupational stress for example, by an excessive workload or through bullying, is a breach of the duty of trust and confidence entitling them to resign and claim constructive unfair dismissal. 
However, the claim is not that easy to get over the line. So first, the claimant has to have more than two years service. And second, the employee must resign with or without notice in response to that breach. And that means that in general terms, they can't hang around and they need to act fairly quickly or risk being seen to waive the breach. But in turn, that doesn't mean that the employee needs to resign in relation to a single isolated incident. The last straw doctrine means that where there's a course of conduct which taken together amounts to a breach of trust and confidence, that can be sufficient. And the advantage from the employee standpoint is that there's no need to establish that they're suffering from any kind of mental health issue as a result of the breach. However, compensation is also not that attractive. The so-called Johnson exclusion zone means that compensation will only be awarded in relation to steps leading up to a dismissal. Conduct which predates the dismissal has to be brought as a common law claim. So in Gab Robbins um, and Triggs, the claimant had expressed concerns about her excessive workload since around 2001. In 2003, she collapsed at home and was signed off work for a week with stress. In 2004, and having continued to express concerns about her workload after being shouted at, she was signed off work again with stress and depression. The claimant received full pay until 5th of November 2004 and then was moved on to statutory sick pay. In December 2004, she lodged a grievance and a meeting was finally arranged for January 2005. And at that meeting, the claimant was clearly unwell. But after it had finished, the HR manager took her to one side and suggested that she try to resolve matters informally. And that was the last straw for the claimant and she resigned on the 15th of February claiming constructive unfair dismissal. At the employment tribunal, the claimant's claim was upheld and she was awarded compensation, including loss of earnings due to being moved on to statutory sick pay. However, in the court of appeal, this was held to be wrong. The claimant could only recover losses flowing from her resignation. The court held that there was a distinction between the losses flowing from the dismissal itself, which was exclusively the subject of a constructive unfair dismissal claim in the employment tribunal, and losses which flowed from prior breaches from the, of the implied trust and confidence, which could only be compensated at common law. And there are some other downsides for claimants in this kind of claim as well. So compensation is subject to a statutory cap. That's currently around 88 and a half thousand pounds or one year's salary, whichever is lower. And as I've just discussed, it's only um, awarded in relation to economic loss sustained as a consequence of the dismissal. So there's no recovery for pain or suffering, loss of immunity or injury to feelings. And a claim is also going to be required to mitigate their loss, for example, by looking for other work. And deductions may be made where an employee's conduct contributes, contributes to any losses. If I could have the next slide, please. So faced with the difficulties of a constructive unfair dismissal claim, not least the requirement to resign, an employee might instead look to bring a disability discrimination claim. And often these kinds of cases are founded on a diagnosis by the GP of anxiety and depression arising out of occupational stress. Now, under the old Disability Discrimination Act, an employee suffering from stress would need to show that they were suffering from a clinically well-recognised mental illness to be brought within the protection of the legislation. But that's no longer necessary. So in order to be afforded protection from disability discrimination, an, an employee now needs to show that they are disabled for the purposes of the Equality Act. And that means that they need to show that they have a physical or mental impairment that has adverse effects that are substantial. And by substantial, we mean more than minor or trivial. The effects must last or be likely to last at least 12 months. And the effects must have an adverse effect on normal day-to-day -day activities. Now, in, in practice, that's not a particularly high bar, but crucially, the thing to remember is that whether an employee is disabled or not is a matter of law and not medicine. So when might stress amount to a disability? But in Harry and Dudley Metropolitan Borough Council, the claimant had been employed as a teacher and a part-time youth worker, and he brought wide-ranging proceedings covering 90 allegations relating to a four-year period. The claimant alleged that he was disabled by reason of depression and he relied on fit notes which referred to stress at work, work-related stress, stress or stress and anxiety. However, a tribunal held that Mr. Herry was not disabled on the basis that he provided little or no evidence that his stress had any effect on his ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. For the tribunal, Mr. Herry's stress was very largely a result of his unhappiness about what he perceived to have been unfair treatment of him and to that extent, extent was clearly a reaction to life events. 
The claim was undeterred and he appealed to the Employment Appeal Tribunal. But again, his claim was dismissed. And in the course of that judgment, the tribunal made some helpful observations about cases where an employee's work situation is alleged to be the cause of their stress. So first, there is a class of case where the individual will not give way or compromise over an issue at work and refuses to return to work, yet in other respects suffers no or little apparent adverse effect on normal day-to-day -day activities. And a doctor may be more likely to refer to the presentation of such an entrenched position as stress rather than anxiety or, or depression. The EAT continues that the Employment Tribunal is not bound to find that there is a mental impairment for the purpose of disability in such a case. Unhappiness with the decision of a colleague, a tendency to nurse grievances, or refusal to compromise are not of themselves mental impairments. They may simply reflect a person's character or personality. And finally, any medical evidence put before the tribunal that supports a diagnosis of mental impairment has to be considered with great care as must any evidence of adverse effects over and above an unwillingness to return to work until an issue is resolved to the employee's satisfaction. And in the end, the question as to whether there is a mental impairment is going to be one for the tribunal. If I could have the next slide, please. So what about compensation? Well, an employee who's successful in a discrimination claim will be compensated on a tortious basis. And that means that any award will be designed at putting them back in the position they would have been had the act of discrimination not occurred. There's no statutory cap, there's no minimum service requirement, and unlike an unfair dismissal claim, discrimination compensation can also include non-financial losses, and in most cases will include an injury to feelings award. And we have some guidelines about the level of award, um, which are called BENTO guidelines. So you can see on the slide, we have the lower band, which is currently 900 pounds to 9,000 pounds. And that's for less serious cases, such as where the act of discrimination is an isolated or a one-off occurrence. Next one is the middle band of 9,000 to 27,000 pounds. And that's for serious cases which don't merit an award in the upper band. And then at the top level, we have uh, the band of the upper band, which is 27,000 to 45,000. And that's for the most serious cases, such as where there's been a lengthy campaign, discriminatory harassment. And it's only going to be in the most exceptional cases then an award for injury to feelings would exceed that, that top level. No medical injury is required for an injury to feelings award, but the claimant can also claim separately for personal injury if they can establish that a mental health condition was caused by the employer's conduct. And unlike in common law claims, the employee does not need to show that, en that their injury was foreseeable. They just need to show that there was some causal link between the act of discrimination and the injury suffered. However, a tribunal will make an attempt at apportionment if it can be established that there was more than one cause of a psychiatric injury. So in Fain and London School of Economics, the Employment Appeal Tribunal confirmed that where a tribunal finds that an employee's personal injury has been caused by a number of factors, including discrimination for which the employer is liable, it should reduce compensation so it reflects only the extent to which the unlawful discrimination contributed to the employee's ill health. But obviously this raises some, some difficult questions about the overlap between an injury to feelings award and a psychiatric injury and an award for psychiatric injury. So in Michalak and Mid Yorkshire Hospitals NHS Trust, a jointly instructed expert summarised an employee who'd been subjected to a lengthy campaign of harassment and discrimination, suffered chronic PTSD, chronic anxiety and depression and an enduring um, personality change. The expert thought it was unlikely that she would work again in a professional capacity. And the tribunal in this case accepted that at the lower end, it is difficult to separate psychiatric injury from injury to feelings, but this case was entirely different. It awarded £56,000 for psychiatric injury, on top of the then maximum £30,000 for injury to feelings. And in total, the claimant received compensation in excess of £2 million to reflect the loss of her career and professional status. At the next slide, please. So what are our tips for dealing with disability discrimination claims in the employment tribunal? The first is, is perhaps obvious, but prevention is always going to be better than cure. So the current epidemic of stress due to COVID and the challenges of working from home raise particular concerns. Isolation is something often cited by employees, 
but managers don't often appreciate the need for support and will assume that everything is well when it might not be. So check in with your team and all of the mental health initiatives in the world are not a substitute for someone asking someone else on a one-to-one -one basis whether they're okay. Jag referred to occupational health and, and the benefits of, of that support, and it can be a very, very valuable resource. But remember that employers ought not to be taking what is said in isolation by OH, but in the round with all the other evidence. So it's necessary to engage with the evidence and with the employee and record that you've done so. Litigants in person are really common in employment tribunal claims, and they'll often throw the kitchen sink at a claim, listing hundreds of discrete allegations. A request for further and better particulars in the form of a Scott schedule, where the claimant is asked to detail each allegation, the date it occurred, the alleged perpetrator, and the precise nature of the disability discrimination relied on, can be helpful in narrowing the issues at an early stage. Consider carefully whether to, dis whether to concede disability. Other than in the most obvious cases, as a minimum, it's going to be worth obtaining GP records and you can always concede disability at a later date. Remember, you're looking for an adverse effect on normal day-to-day -day activities. And to that end, a disability impact statement where the claimant sets out the effect of their disability on their life can be helpful and should form part of any directions for a hearing. And when you receive that, look out for inconsistencies with the claim form and any medical evidence. Beware the claimant's schedule of loss. And this could be a particular issue with litigants in person who often have unrealistic expectations about what they can expect to achieve. Consider providing the presidential guidance on bento bans ahead of the date that the schedule is due. And in claims involving personal injury, medical evidence is going to be key to de determine the causal link between the injury suffered and the employer's actions. However, for cost reasons, it's often sensible to request a split liability and remedy hearing at an early stage. And that will avoid the cost of instructing an expert if the claim is unsuccessful in liability. And finally, regularly review the evidence. Tribunal litigation is costly, both in terms of professional fees and management time. So unless there is a fear of floodgates, it's often sensible to consider um, commercial settlement. And that's, that's me for now. Um, I hope that was helpful. I'm going to hand over to my colleague now, Chris Scott. Thanks. Thanks very much, Angela. And thank you, Jag. Uh, earlier. Um, essentially, if, if you follow the advice that JAG was giving in the earlier part of the webinar and then some of the points that Angela made, you'll never need to deal with me. Um, I'm uh, a, an experienced litigator who's, who's dealt with many um, claims arising from occupational stress and also bullying and harassment. And there are some common threads running through all of them, one of which is that they can be incredibly costly claims in terms of both compensation and the costs that are incurred by the lawyers, dare I say it, but they also can be hugely complex and time consuming claims. These aren't cases that are simply passed off to insurers. Um, the, the business on the receiving end of a occupational stress claim is likely to remain heavily involved in it. Uh, and they're also incredibly sensitive claims, both from an individual's and, and human perspective, and we're often talking about personalities here, but also reputationally for the organisations who may find themselves as a defendant to court proceedings in open court, essentially, and on public record. So we want to make sure that we make good decisions about how we handle them and ensure that we've got the right information at the right time in order to progress the case effectively. So the, the, first, um, the first point to recognise is the diversity of sectors that are affected by these issues. Workplace stress knows no boundaries, much like COVID. Uh, we, we see claims in education, healthcare, uh, utility sector, power generation businesses, uh, even one of the one of the claims and, and authorities Angela referred to was against a, a loss adjusting business, a so part of the insurance sector, GAB Robbins, um, who no longer exist as a, as a business in their own right. But um, I know we have some loss adjusters in the audience today. 
um, food and beverage um, and, and even, you know, government sector and probably the most high profile um, occupational stress, bullying and harassment claim that any of us um, will will remember possibly this year, possibly even this decade is, is the one that we all got a lot of insights into last week uh, when there was a lack of support um, being charged um, at the the firm as as Meghan Markle referred to it and lawyers have been appointed to investigate those allegations now um, so as well as applying across a diversity of sectors there are also a real range and subtlety of issues that can generate stress in the workplace um, you know what what makes me unhappy what makes me stressed and is that going to lead to a diagnosable psychiatric injury? And there are some uh, recurrent elements that, that do crop up. Um, one of which is, have I, have I got too much work? Have I got an excessive workload or have I got unrealistic deadlines to meet that my employer is setting for me? Is, is the work I'm doing too hard? Is it too challenging? And is it unsuitable for me relative to my experience and expertise? Am, am I in a position where no one's looking after me? Have I got a lack of access to line management and that level of guidance, supervision and support? Or the flip side of the coin, and, and, and quite often there is a, a flip side to these issues. Am I being micromanaged? Is my line manager giving me excessive amounts of feedback and, and essentially doing that in a non-constructive way um, we as, as well as those interpersonal relations we also see stress claims arising in part because of the quality of the work environment in a physical sense um, in, in, in the education sector sometimes we see claims from uh, highly motivated tutors and, and lecturers who feel that their lecture theatres and equipment they're using isn't up to scratch and it's holding them back on delivering the sort of classes they want to to provide to the students. But, you know, in, in very much um, current um, consideration, what about the quality of the work equipment in terms of protective work equipment and the stress and anxiety that would flow from issues regarding PPE? Um, Back on the interpersonal front, there can often be a complaint that an individual's line manager is, in, in, in parenthesis, a dinosaur, isn't sufficiently woke, doesn't understand the sort of stresses that an individual is subject to in the wider sense, and there are personality clashes. Um, equally, when, when it comes to review of performance, then we see claims arising essentially motivated by a lack of career progression or a suggestion that somebody has been unfairly treated in the way that their performance has been assessed. Um, so a lack of progression. And again, there's a flip side to that coin, because if somebody is over promoted, somebody's given too much of an accelerated path, then they can develop a, a very genuine imposter syndrome where they may actually be operating beyond their skill set, all of which can produce feelings of stress, anxiety, and possibly lead to a psychiatric illness. So the stress, stress is everywhere, and we need to then consider what sort of tactics are going to be deployed to secure the kind of evidence both in terms of the sources and the volume of evidence that we're going to need to establish whether the complaint about workplace stress is a valid one, and in some instances they certainly are, or whether there are competing factors and whether the stress, anxiety and psychiatric injury can all necessarily be put at the door of the employer or whether there are some other contributing elements to somebody's lifestyle or, or issues they're facing. We need to look at witness evidence, and these claims are can, can be very heavy in terms of the number of witnesses who are involved. Obviously, line managers would be uh, a major source of information, but 
colleagues on a similar scale within an organization, comparators, people who are experiencing the same kind of work, the same volumes, the same challenges managed by the same individuals. Um, also looking beyond the workplace at potentially other acquaintances and external sources of information, perhaps to try and identify what personal stresses somebody may be subject to. And beyond the, the live witnesses and, and those kind of investigations, a deep dive into all of the corroborative contemporaneous records that might exist, the health records, GP, hospital treatment records, potentially clinic records, as well as occupational health, counselling and other therapies, uh, just to build up that depth of the factual matrix to begin to understand the combination of factors that may be at play and working on an individual's well-being. So we need to focus those investigations to, to try and assess what someone's mental state might realistically have been and look for objective indicators about the alleged breaches that are being raised. Um, what can we actually see in, in, in the documents about how a person has been working or how they've been treated? And all the time we're looking for an independent narrative to express their interpersonal relations within the workplace, to give some credible indicators of what personal jeopardy somebody may have been subjected to and and you know one of the one of the things we could look at is their own related behavior so examples would be looking for instances where an individual has perhaps been shedding work not getting through what work they've been allocated not meeting deadlines missing appointments for example but on the other side of the coin a, another trait that's sometimes demonstrated is one of people hoarding work and actually building more and more work onto their own shoulders, but that ultimately producing a source of stress, um, perhaps born out of misplaced ambition in, in the first place. Um, we can look at attendance in, in the widest sense, but on, on, on one end of the spectrum, and perhaps more obviously, looking at the level of absenteeism that somebody's experiencing. If, if somebody is struggling with the idea of coming into work they may well have a poor attendance record whether it's put down to stress or other factors but absenteeism is is sometimes a, a thread that leads to a, a, an objective view on on stress at work but alternatively the other side of the coin equally is identifying somebody who has been worried or concerned about actually taking time off work because they feel vulnerable. They don't want to be exposed, perhaps, if they feel they're underperforming. And so we sometimes see presenteeism, as it's come to be known, where holidays aren't being taken. Um, another factor for investigation is the question of accessibility to line management and, and whether there's a, a regular dialogue, whether the sort of feedback that Angela and Jag have, have mentioned is available regularly or not. And then also accessibility to the wider support structures that an organization might provide or may not have at all, depending on how progressive their workplace mental health policy is. Um, and at the end of the day, we could always be talking about an individual who has a very autocratic approach to their work and wants things doing their way and, and perhaps a hair trigger personality that is going to lead to conflict and antagonism and them experiencing stress. But again, how do we convey that objectively by using the evidence of people around them? Uh, next slide, please. So thinking about our strategy and, and acknowledging the complexity of these claims and the volume of evidence that's going to be needed, if we are reacting to litigation, we are going to be up against a court timetable with a hell of a lot of work to do and a hell of a lot of ground to cover. So it would be highly advisable as soon as a letter of claim is presented to start getting our ducks in a row evidentially, identifying the key witnesses, actually arranging to sit down with them and begin to gather that more holistic view 
of a scenario, workplace relationship, volumes of work, etc. And while we're doing that, actually test the quality of the witnesses as part of the investigation, their credibility, their reliability, whether they're displaying some character traits that might prove problematic in a line manager. And, and feed that back into the overall decision-making process about the claim. Uh, but we also have to consider the sensitivities. Is this case too controversial for comfort in terms of, you know, potentially the seniority of the, the line manager in question? Sometimes it can be a, a board level issue, um, for example. And again, it may just be for the, for the wider business perspective and that reputational sensitivity that these cases are just too challenging to consider airing in public. There is too much dirty laundry, and that might influence a different approach being taken. Um, but where we do feel robust and, and we do feel there is a good challenge to be made, it's helpful to give the fullest possible response to what are often very detailed letters of claim during that pre-action protocol period before proceedings have been issued and those costs have been incurred, uh, and and give them that shot across the bounds. Um, there are a couple of other points, but I'm I'm going to skip on to the next slide, please, because I know we're we're running short of time now. And I just I just wanted to mention the the possibility that we may be on the verge of a sea change. I think we've certainly seen a, a sea change um, over the last year, particularly in terms of. Um, the prevalence of discussions about mental health and well-being but the case law has a lot of catching up to do potentially because the leading case here is still the matter of Sutherland and Hatton which dates back to 2002 and a court of appeal decision there which confirmed that traditional EL principles apply a claimant has to establish breach of duty foreseeability and a causal link to the injury, psychiatric injury, and the losses they've suffered. And essentially to prove that this kind of harm, psychiatric injury, was foreseeable to this particular employee. And of course, foreseeability is the product of what was actually known about that employee and perhaps what they told us. Now, it's declared in, in Sutherland and Hatton that the employer can take the employee at face value and assume that they can withstand the usual pressures uh, of, of work unless there's a known vulnerability. But so much has changed. And if we think of over the last 12 months, but also over the last 18, 20 years, if Lady Justice Hale was making that decision again in Sutherland and Hatton today, would she have made the same decision? We've had the Stevenson and Farmer review that Jack talked about. We've got declared government policy encouraging employers to be more proactive. We've seen huge strides in the charity sector. Mills and Reeve have, have done a lot of work with Birmingham Mind, for example, and, and I'm sure your organisations would have partnered with other charities. And we have high profile instances of mental health vulnerability. We've just, just gone past the, the, the first anniversary of Caroline Flack's tragic death. Um, We've also seen a shift in judicial case law around the willingness to impose greater responsibility on employers for elements of conduct or behavior that they weren't previously necessarily anticipated to be responsible for. Um, the, the senior courts, the Supreme Court, have openly expressed their application of principles of social justice in the case of Mohammed that's referred to on the slide. I think factoring all of those elements together, we may see a, a lowering of the bar and a, 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 a widening of the gateway for, for claimants who, who might be minded to pursue these sorts of claims. So uh, next slide, please. So that brings me to the end of my contribution this morning. Um, we're always interested in learning from our audience and particularly your comments on how Jag, Angela and myself have performed of key importance to us is understanding what you're interested in. So please do take the opportunity to provide us with some topics and feedback on what you'd like to hear about. And I think you should be um, receiving a feedback form that'll pop through at the end of the session now. Uh, I'd also like to thank Kate, Claire 
and Harriet, who've all been working behind the scenes to maintain technical continuity and make sure we're all effective or as effective as we can be as speakers. And I'd like to thank you all for the time you've given this morning to listening and watching. So thank you very much.